Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech Talks on a Thursday. And we're going to have a show called Technology Matters with Avram Goodblatt of uh, Stratocore and Mike Medelitz of Fry Family Office and Fry Capital Partners. I'm going to call the show today um, Archiving on the Internet and other things of interest between these two gentlemen. So, Avram, you are the host. You join us by Skype from Philadelphia. And Mike, you are the guest. You join us from another location by Skype from Philadelphia. Avram, it's all yours. Thank you, Jay. I should make one little note here. I do work for Stratacore, but this effort with Think Hack Hawaii is independent of Stratacore. I'm my own man on it. You can blame me for anything I do here, but not Stratacore. We will blame you accordingly, Avram. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, this is a session of Tech Matters, wide-ranging discussions related to technology development and Hawaii. Um, even though Mike is not in Hawaii, uh, I think he has some things that he's doing which Hawaii can learn from and apply. Um, Mike is a man of many activities and talents. He has worked over the years in, uh, I believe, technology transfer. He's now involved in uh, a project for taking the entire history of his family's uh, news videos. He'll explain what that's about and making them available on the Internet. And separately, he's working for a company, uh, Fry, which has different, uh, shall we say, incarnations of different names, he'll explain that later, which is currently involved in setting up a venture capital fund. Do I have that correct, Mike? Uh, basically, yeah. We, um, Fraud Capital Partners emerged out of some venture funds, but I'll, I'll explain that in two points. Great, thank you. So, the first question is, Mike, what does anything you do have to ha have to do with Hawaii? I understand that your family had some, at least, um, interest in Hawaii, over the years. You might explain that personal matter first to understand part of the reason that I've asked you uh, onto this show. Sure. Um, well, there's a number of connections with, with Hawaii. I think probably the earliest was um, my, uh, my mother. I'll probably be talking a bit about her. She was uh, quite a visionary. But um, I think in the early 70s, you know, my mother developed an interest in uh, Hawaiian traditional spirituality. Um, first through some of the early works of Max Freedom Long and then through some later translators and later interpreters. Um, towards the end of her life, she took a great deal of comfort in certain popularized versions of Hawaiian traditional spirituality. And she, um, you know, while it wasn't a, a kind of, um, it wasn't a sort of religious practice for her, it was certainly something that had comforted her. And, and she, she talked about it quite a lot. Additionally, um, two friends of mine uh, from my San Francisco days, I spent quite a lot of time on the West Coast, um, you know, one of whom is Hawaiian and one of whom spent a lot of time there um, you know, studying connections between Hawaiian traditional spirituality and um, some other indigenous uh, spirituality systems. So from that kind of back end, uh, there's quite a lot that uh, certainly I'm fascinated by with Hawaii, um, as well as some stuff that's, you know, more connected to some of the innovation and, and capital work that I've done as well. Um, <laughs> Why don't we start by talking about the Internet Archiving Project and what you're doing with that? Right. Um, well, a, a bit of backstory. Um, my, um, my mother, my entire family is really very involved in, in technology, um, both as consumers and as um, almost sort of research and development uh, um, aficionados. Um, my, uh, my mother really searched during the 1970s for a... Um, or a computer that that really that people would find easy to use, and she felt that that if people had computers that were easy to use, it would change the way people did business, change the way people you know, lived their lives, and change the way people learn. She was fascinated by that kind of thing, so um, she got very involved in uh, Apple Computer uh, in the early 1980s. Um, was fascinated by the Macintosh as a graphical user interface that was, you know. Um, uh, commercially available and, and, and really widespread. And, um, you know, was very, uh, very active. She would, she would kind of go to the trade shows and buttonhole, um, buttonhole vendors and tell them how to do their products. I think her first call to Apple 
um, <clears throat> before she invested, because she called the guy Kawasaki picked up the phones. So there were a whole sort of range of, of, um, of involvements there. But I was also fascinated with the news, um, with you know, television and media technology. So starting in about 1979, um, she got involved in sort of videotape very early. Starting about 1979, I think with the Iranian hostage crisis, my mother really started to um, basically videotape the news 24 hours a day. And that, you know, accelerated and exactly, you know, accelerated when CNN came on screen in 1980. So by the end of her life, so in 1982, when she died in 2012, she pretty much videotaped every cable news channel 24 hours a day uh, for that entire time. It led to about 40,000 video cassettes, which is a staggering amount. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of fun stories about how the family kind of worked its way around that and things she told and all that. But the, the, the upshot was that um, in dealing with her estate over the last couple of years, we had to find a home for a massive archive of physical video cassettes, some beta, some VHS. Um, my, uh, my stepsister is a journalist, uh, Stephanie Stoke. She managed to find a, a link to something called the Internet Archive, which is an organization based in San Francisco. Um, it's founded by Bruce for Kale, who's a, a little, uh, valley tech guy. And the mission of the Internet Archive is really to digitize, preserve, and make available in adult human knowledge. And this was very similar to what my mother really wanted to do with the video taking the cassettes. She really wanted people to be able to use the media, be able to understand how stories change, be able to, to track back and see which bits of the story have dropped out, which have changed. So she was very, very interested in preserving and making um, Sorry, are, are we still rolling? Thank you. The Internet Archives, well, I contacted them. I said I'm sitting on 40,000 videos from about 1980 to 2012. They said, can we have it, please? And uh, so we did manage to, uh, to, to ship that across the country and give them a small donation to kind of help them start to digitize it. What's, what's occurred is that they've got about a $1.5 million project now to digitize this entire 40,000 tape archive and to make it searchable on the internet. Um, apparently, uh, this was during the, the heyday, or rather the, the, the initiation of closed captioning. The internet archive is going to be able to turn the closed captioning into uh, searchable metadata in order to make all these years of television news clips and close to social media by people, which I think is kind of an amazing thing. Does that record your picture out in the world things all the time? Oh, there's a bit of background noise here. Thank you. Yes, Mike, could you repeat what you said? I was just asking if that gives you a sense of, of kind of What's going on with the Internet Archive? You know, they, they're going on this, this, these 40,000 video cassettes, and my role really is just to kind of help them raise funds. They're trying to raise about 1.5 million to, um, to digitize this collection. And my, my role is really to kind of help them and, you know, and, and, and help us it a little bit to try and, uh, and, and raise some money. Well, let's hang on that question, gentlemen. We're going to take a short break. Uh, this is Think Tech Talks. We're talking about technology. Technology matters with Avram Goodblatt and Mike Medelitz. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm here with Liz Hsu. And we love Agritech. In fact, she's from the Department of uh, Agriculture. And we're underwater. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. And we love things that have to do with agriculture, aquaponics, hydroponics, all that. So, Liz. What is your interest in this? To grow more local food for local people. I knew that. Yes. Okay, it's 4 to 5 every other Monday. Come and see us on Agritech in the Islands. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, come learn with us. We'll see you then. Aloha. Okay. Okay, here we are. We're 
We're back. We're live. We're here at uh, the, the core of downtown Honolulu in Pioneer Plaza. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And we're doing a, our Think Tech talk series, namely Technology Matters, with Avram Goodblatt of Stratacore, uh, although he's not speaking for Stratacore in this case, and Mike Metalis with Fry Family Office and Fry Capital uh, Partners. And we're talking about uh, archiving on the internet and technology and the organization of the business. Uh, take it away, Avram. All yours. Mike, I'm sure you've given thoughts on how you want people to be able to find your family's archive once it's digitized. And I was thinking some of what you've been thinking about might be of benefit for Think Tech Hawaii to consider, since Think Tech Hawaii also has large numbers of already digitized recordings, as you saw at their website. And um, how do we, what are the keys to making them really useful and available? Have you given any thought to that in regarding your family archive? So uh, I have to say I've been very fortunate that the Unit Archive has been involved in this kind of work for about 10, 15 years. Um, so Mike, they, can you speak up? We can't hear you very well. The Internet Archive has really kind of given a lot of thought to this. And their, um, their, you know, their impetus is really to use keywords and metadata in innovative ways to try and um, categorize these various video clips. You know, when you've got a, a six-hour cassette that's got you know, six hours of, of cable news, Breaking it up is a very, very difficult thing. Fortunately, as I think I mentioned previously, there's some closed captioning involved. And what the Internet Archive is able to do is to use that closed captioning in a way that uh, basically enables keyword search. What we're trying to do is enable people to look along their interests and look along uh, basically longitudinally and to find out what kinds of things uh, might be in the archives, so they don't have to know what they're looking for. They can search, they can you know, run basically the way that people would use any normal search engine. And this, you know, this, this is the result of, of digitizing the, the kind of closed captioning technology on that archive. In terms of, of popularizing it, you know, we really want, um, we're waiting a little bit until there's, uh, there's a bit more of it digitized. They did some digitization of some of the Tiananmen Square footage on the 20th anniversary back, um, uh, back earlier this year. However, um, when more of it is, is available, um, we're going to probably be using a good deal of social media, a good deal of um, uh, following some hashtags and using those kinds of tools to integrate this, um, this archive in other social media conversation that people are having. So the people who are talking about contemporary issues, for example, of police brutality, or for example, of women's rights, which are both you know, hot button, very key issues socially now, will be able to use those kinds of hashtags as archive. And the archive will actually kind of pop up as people are looking for news and information um, regarding these kinds of issues. So what we're trying to do is present it's, it's almost a curated approach to this kind of work, so that um, people are able to find what they want, what they want isn't excluded, but they're not barraged with a huge amount of information. Does that make any sense to you, Arkham? No, no, that's very good. I think that that has some applications to I think Tech Hawaii uh, archives as well. Um, have you done any work with um, <clears throat> uh, concept maps regarding that? Um, I think. The, I haven't particularly. Um, you know, there's, there's much, much smarter people than me at the Internet Archive who are working um, to try to map connections between the, um, between the different bits of the archive. Um, I think the news archive itself is really, they're really probably leaving that connected with keyword. I think the difference between that archive and the kind of things that, for example, you were showing me in Think Tech. Hawaii and uh, I think Chakuli was the other the website that you, you showed me. Um, you know, there's something about how it's integrated with other kinds of um, other kinds of interests that might be useful for tech in Hawaii. That kind of thing I think is probably more useful than a particular keyword system. If you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Well, um, because we don't have a large amount of time. I'd like now to switch over 
to the other part of your split personality there. Okay. Um, I don't know which one is Dr. Jekyll, which one is Mr. Hyde. Maybe they're both Dr. Jekyll, I'm hoping. Um, but seriously, the side of venture capital. Right. And maybe in the end we can link it back to the archive and then see how those are related. I think, I think there's, there really are some connections there. So, um, Fly Family Office and Fly Capital Partners are joint ventures between um, uh, me and uh, Jonathan Fly, the British businessman who's been a friend of mine for quite some time. And Jonathan has a huge amount of experience in wealth management. And uh, Fly Family Office has been established with, you know, 40 or 50 very select families who, you know, have the, the, the requisite wealth to require a family office management. But they're also looking for interesting investment opportunities. Um, and you know, most, they're all British, and so um, you know, if you look at returns on capital inside Britain that are not property, there are, all, there, there are a number of um, there are a number of pressures on, on British capital to look outside Britain uh, to find good returns. So Foreign Capital Partners was established not exactly as an adjunct, but as a kind of sister firm in the office. And Foreign Capital Partners is really an investment origination uh, house. Our job is to put together um, put together investment funds that will be interesting not only to clients from Fry Camp from Fry Family Office, but to wider investors. Give you an example. Uh, one of the areas in, in London, in London Tech, that actually is relatively well funded, is early venture startups. And there's also quite a market for IPOs and you know, that last little bit of bridge or mezzanine financing. The interim period from venturing where a, you know, a firm has started up and has uh, relatively good sales and, and possibly some contacts and getting some market traction to that point of IPO or exit or trade sale, that, that chasm is not well funded. That growth capital is not well funded. And so Fly Capital Partners is putting together a £150 million growth fund to try to identify those, those growing companies that are likely to generate a lot of return for investors. Um, wins and, and, and exit. Um, equally, we've got a, quite an interest in renewable energy. Uh, I just finished a, a course on environmental risk and resilience at a World from Stanford uh, last week. And you know, this, this issue of uh, you know, renewable energy and what are the business opportunities in addressing issues of climate change and issues of uh, you know, the social effects of climate change is one that we're really kind of interested in we're trying to learn more about. We're building a renewable energy fund based around fossil <coughs> in, in the UK. So those are just, just a couple of the, the kinds of things that, that the private equity firm is doing, the, the, the family office are doing. Um, and that, you know, connected to that, there are a couple of things that I noticed when I was sort of looking around at some of the, the, the tech stuff in Hawaii that, um, that might be of interest. I don't know if we've got, you know, where we are in terms of the break, but you know, we may want to go into that in a bit. Well, I think this is probably a good time for a break. What do you say? Let's have a sure, break. That's, that's <clears throat> and uh, we'll regroup and come back in a minute. This is Think Tech Talks. Uh, we're talking about technology. That's why we call the show Technology Matters. We're talking about ar archiving on the internet and other things. Um, with Avram Goodblatt of Stratocor, although he's not speaking for Stratocor, and Mike uh, Metalitz, who is with Fry Family Office and Fry Capital Partners. We'll be right back after this short break when you guys can come at it again. Aloha, I'm Kaylee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. One of the things I love being, however, is the host of the weekly program on Think Tech Hawaii called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. I get to interview movers and shakers in our town and across the world so that you and I together can learn and to grow. Please join me every Monday from 2 to 3 p.m. or watch us on the recording www.thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and ehana kako. Let's work together. Aloha. My name is David Day and I'm really interested in international business, foreign policy, geopolitics and national security and that's why I host Think Tech Global. I bring in guests from all over the world who know about these various issues in enormous depth and detail. Come learn with me every Thursday afternoon right here at 4 o'clock. I'll see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. 
where Think Tech talks, where technology matters, where we're talking about archiving on the internet with Avram Goodblatt, who is our host in Philadelphia. He joins us by Skype. He's with Stratocore, although he doesn't speak for them on this show. And Mike Medelitz, who also joins us on a separate connection from Philadelphia on Skype. He's with Fry Family Office and Fry Capital Partners. Uh, take it away, Avram. Thank you, Jay. Mike, um, let's focus in this last part of the show on, for example, how can we use the ThinkTech Hawaii archives and organize them so that they're available to people like Fry when they're looking. Of course, you're not so interested in startups. You're more interested in growth. That's the area that you're talking about. But still, how can these archives be of use to people like Fry when they're doing their research? What kinds of questions are they having that we could help with on our end? I think when we're looking for investments, we're looking for three <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, when we're looking for investments, we're looking for three things together, and we'd like to be able to connect those three things. One is great ideas, new innovative ideas. The second is people with the skills and talent to make those happen. That's not just coding talent and tech talent, but management talent. And the third is capital. Is there access to capital? Is there capital nearby? Are we going to be able to integrate those three things to generate some kind of new firm? And any kind of system that connects those three things or that enables us to do that, that's going to be useful to us. So, so we could, for example, have organized our information in ThinkTech Hawaii so it's easy to find what are the new ideas that have been presented over time. And who are the people and what are their skills that have been talking? Exactly. There are, um, there are a number of big buckets that you could use to tag some of that content to make it more easily searchable, or at least more searchable from, from the kinds of uh, perspectives that, that we've got. Things like you know, access to capital, things like culture. There's a lot of very interesting cultural discussion in Think Tank Hawaii, um, and things like development, as well as new ideas. Those kinds of tags and those kinds of I guess what we used to call them consultative buckets, that'll really help us you know, as we're looking around to put things together, things that might not actually have, have met um, in order to generate some kind of new investment. Let's just get out of the box here. Um, could you identify any aspects of Hawaiian culture, even the kinds of things that your mother was interested in, that if presented in a proper way would be considered assets in the situation in Hawaii to a place like Fry. I know that's kind of a reach, but you're a creative guy. What can you come up with? Uh, well, I haven't been described as creative in a while. Um, you know, I gotta say, I, I think there's a there's a there's an acceptance of serendipity in my my outsider's understanding of of, of the life of Hawaiian culture, and an understanding of you know the the time and process that it takes for Different, um, different elements in a group, for example, to get to know each other and get to know each other's stories in order to be able to move forward. And that kind of thing is often missing in, you know, when, uh, when commercial investors are put, trying to put together a deal. They're looking at the numbers, they're looking at technical capabilities. But that, that sense of uh, harmonizing culture and allowing the serendipity of that to work, that could be a real, that could be a real bonus. Can I ask you guys a question? You know, uh, talking about archiving for ThinkTech and what we do, I, I've been getting email from a woman on the mainland on a regular basis who uh, presents as someone who can do internet archiving. This has only been going on for about a week or two. And uh, she wants to take down, I mean to download, uh, our content from our YouTube channel and other channels and she wants to put it on her server and she wants to you know do something to organize it and make it searchable mm -hmm. and um, she would do that for us and I and I had to write to her and ask her to confirm this she would do that for us for free uh, and I guess she has the benefit of uh, having it on her server uh, she's not paying for it, but then neither are we. <clears throat> and we can link to her server and have our 
our uh, audience link to her server, search on her server, and have the benefit of wh whatever organizational um, you know, efforts she made. So that I mean, is a lot of work in that, and that's why I asked her to confirm it, because I couldn't believe it. Um, and she's still after me to do this. So and I'm wondering whether there's something I'm missing in the way this kind of business works. I mean, is, is there such value for this woman that she can take down our stuff and put it on her server and show it uh, that it justifies all that work, all that effort? Or perhaps there's something else that makes it worthwhile for her? Um, it's an interesting question. Can't, um, can't hear you, Mike. Sorry, that's an interesting question. I mean, the Internet Archive, of course, is a nonprofit. So they're not trying to, to, to make a lot of money off this. They are developing a, a suite of kind of premium tools for, for search and for longer access that they may sell access to. But the basic archive, they want to be publicly accessible for no money. Um, so there isn't really a business model for them in that. The only thing I can, I can, I can imagine is that somehow doing that, that work of integration um, provides some kind of input to you know, some of the intellectual property. And I don't understand, I don't, I don't know uh, offhand, what the intellectual property rights are, who owns the content on Think Tech Hawaii at the moment. Um, but you know, working on something in a, in, a, in a substantive way is one of the ways to become part owner of intellectual, of intellectual property. So it's something to kind of think about, you know, who you really want to, um, uh, who, who you'd like to be in business with, as it were. And that's another question. Is, who is the material being organized for? Hmm. Well, the public, I would imagine. I mean, she, she's making it public, public, uh, publicly available. By the way, to answer your question, Mike, we, we treat it as a public domain. We don't, we don't put any limitations on it. Can use it. Anybody can use it. And I would tell her that, and I would tell her that she doesn't have an exclusive on anything, um, sure. but apparently still willing to do it. Maybe there are advertisements involved. Maybe there's some kind of membership. I, I don't know what it might be, because she can't lock them out of it. Um, yeah. Maybe it's the search mechanism that gives her a business model. Um, I can't imagine how this is worthwhile and how, you know, the, the economics work. It, it may also be that this is a demonstration project for her. We, we, we can't really know. I would also, I would encourage you though to take a look at the Internet Archive. It's the website is archive.org, mm -hmm. and they've got something called a Wayback Machine. Um, it's on the front page, and what that machine does is give you a snapshot of any website you want from whatever date you want. So if you want to see what your website looked like on you know December fifteenth, you know two thousand nine. You, you put that in the Wayback Machine with your URL, and that's what you'll see. Um, so there, there are these resources out there, and it's really interesting to see how people layer them and put them together to try to generate business models. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds also like uh, this is something, you know, where we, that is, all of us collectively, have generated so much content that there's really a need to do this now, and that the, the need will increase as we continue to generate contact, uh, content. Absolutely. Can I just ask a question? I mean, at the moment, what's your, what use, other than YouTube, what, what social media are you guys using, and how are you, um, how are you connecting with other people on social media, and how are you using that? Um, not just to gain information about art, about what kinds of uh, categories to do, but to connect with people and to get your content out there. Well, we, we use uh, Twitter, Facebook. Mm. Uh, we're getting into Instagram. Mm. Um, and we use a blast email. We send our email to, uh, you know, uh, our list every day. Um, and then we broadcast on Ustream and right. uh, then upload to YouTube. And then we submit to uh, local community television. That's about the extent of it. It's, it, 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 it's a lot more than a lot of people do, so that, you know, you should definitely pat yourselves on the back for that. Well, I wish it were more perfect, and that's, <laughs> that's our goal, to make it more seamless, more perfect, so that everything works just as well. Uh, reality is there's a lot of moving parts on what I just described to you. 
absolutely we got to move things back and forth and i'm sure there's a bit of shuffling and a bit of cutting and pacing but um you know first get it to work and then then, then improve it <laughs> there you go <laughs> One could say that there's several levels to this kind of situation. There's the biggest organization so that you can find things. And then there's kind of an intelligence added on top of it saying, who's trying, who's a typical type of person and what are they looking for? And how does providing them with what they're looking for help Hawaiian culture and economy? Right. Right, I think we right to identify those those two levels of you know how do we organize it, and um, and who and how do we communicate about it with other people? Who's interested in communicating with us about it? Who are our audiences? I think the other the other angle is to figure out who could benefit and is not engaging, and who could we benefit from engaging with this with this content. So. Uh, the thinking, for example, about you know, Hawaii is a great crossroads between East and West, so there may be Asian markets that might be uh, interested in you know, tech development and, and, and tech goings on in Hawaii. So you've got the East-West Center there. There's quite a lot of discussion about that kind of exchange. So thinking a little bit un in an unorthodox manner about who might want to... Um, who, who might want to know about this content is, this, is maybe the third piece. There's a history of interesting things happening on the Hawaiian Islands, also in tech development, that don't necessarily leave, other than some money for the services they paid for, any long-term lasting effect in, in Hawaii. This is not just true of Hawaii, this is true of many places. Um, I know there's um, startup conferences that happen here where people come from the mainland and other countries and they get together and they windsurf. Uh, Jay, do you remember the name of that thing? I forget what it's called. No, sorry, I don't remember. I'll get you the I'll get the information on it for the next session. But great place to do that. They're basically people coming from the outside, having a good time in Hawaii, spending their money here, which is great. But it isn't necessarily really involving the local people in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Right. Which is normal. It's like you come and stay at a hotel, you enjoy the hotel, then you go home. Right. What we're trying to do and thinking about is there's so many people who've come to Hawaii and actually even moved here after their success in Silicon Valley that you have a lot of brain skills, brain power coming to Hawaii with people who have a very positive feeling toward Hawaii and would do something, how do you capitalize on all that skill sitting on the islands right now? And there's a lot of it. I'll be interviewing some of those people as we go along. Right. I mean, from my perspective... Um, a little louder, please. A little louder. From, from, my, from my perspective, we're looking at showing them exactly those, those, those things, good ideas, people with skills and not just tech skills, again, management skills, and, and access to capital. They may have their own capital, but the, the, the idea of being able to leverage additional capital, successful people want to continue that kind of thing. They, they don't stop. And so providing them with those kinds of ingredients and access to those kinds of ingredients, whether it's international or not, or whether the, the people have come from outside or not, but showing them, hey, we've got this it's kind of like a, almost like a studio where we've got, well, here are these, these really, this great talent and this great idea and this money, and we're going to put all this together. That, that mix, that pulls people out of the woodwork, and people love to get involved in that company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, it remains to be seen, you know, whether that model would, would work for the local market, um, even people doing research on culture points, um, and whether it, whether it would work for the people who've been here and then have gone, but have a kindly recollection of how it was, um, and the and the question is, uh, you know, how narrow, how narrow should the archive be to be useful to the public? Uh, arguably, if you have a good search mechanism, it doesn't have to be narrow at all. Uh, it can be fairly broad because you can always zero in on things with, with search. And I guess the question is, how good is a search engine? Um, because you know there are search engines, 
And then there are search engines. <laughs> you want it to be intuitive, like Google uh, or um, you know the the one with the Apple, the Apple uh, browser Safari is very good on searching. Actually, um, I guess it uses Google, but it's uh, you search on the address line and you can find anything in a minute. Uh, so yeah. so query. I mean, how narrow do you want to be with something as um, you know uh, uh, academic uh, and uh, as as for example Hawaiian culture. Right. I think the, the kind of purposes that, that certainly the album is talking about, I think you do want that breadth, but you want the, you know, the, whatever the internal algorithms are, you want them to highlight the kinds of things that are going to, you know, kind of draw that, that sort of sustainable investment. They're going to highlight the skills that are, on, that are on the island or accessible to the island, the capital that's on the islands and, and accessible to the islands, and the uh, and the, and the ideas that are developed there, even if they're developed in these, um, these sort of sessions where people come from, from, from outside, you may be able to engage with those if people understand through your archives that, they, that these kinds of skills and capital are available. No, it's interesting that this discussion makes me think that, you know, the old notion of, uh, it's not very old, but the notion of searching on Google or whatever algorithm you use, uh, and looking through a body of material that may be huge, but all relatively recent, is changing. Mm -hmm. this, this, uh, this is an indication that it's all changing, and uh, that the mm -hmm. amount of content online is changing, and therefore the way we you know, look through it and find things in the haystack is changing. Um, and as time goes on, you know, this is going to change all the more. I mean, we're, we're into the internet by less than 20 years, really. Um, and all the big content is within the last five years, really. Um, so what happens when we understand how to generate the content, uh, we understand how to catalog the content, and people want to find things, you know, with even greater accuracy than ever before? It's changing mm -hmm. under our feet, isn't it? That's what you guys are talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're looking not just at a kind of library model, or even a kind of editor and curating model where you, 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 you want to know what's out there and you want it kind of ranked in terms of relevance. But you're looking almost at an archaeological model. So which layers came first? Which parts built on which other parts? How does all that relate? And finding a way to represent that information, whether it's graphically or spatially or in terms of layout on a page, that's, that's going to be amazing. Well, Ivan, we only have a minute left. But may I ask you to summarize, and then we'll close. Well, Ivan, um, you want to take a shot at that? I mean, it, it seems to me like there's a huge amount of, not only do you have a huge amount of content, but there's a huge, huge amount of resources in Hawaii that could lead to quite a number of interesting investment and in tech developments. And then finding the right way to organize it and to communicate about it and, and to present those, those layers of information and those, those, let's say, factors of production, that money, talent, and, uh, and capital, or money, talent, and ideas. I think, I think that's the key for you. Yes, and, and I really like your reference to layers because that's really what the situation is here in Hawaii. People come to Hawaii, they enjoy the beach, they enjoy the sun. That's the first layer. Mm. We're saying there's much richer things even below that first layer that have more value than just a nice place to have a short vacation. I would imagine. <laughs> and it's, ex it's exposing those layers through the web that can get us more long-term relationships and more benefit to the local culture and economy. Thank you, Avram. Avram Goodblatt of uh, Stratocore and uh, Mike Medelitz of uh, Fry Family Office and Fry Capital Partners. Talking about uh, archiving on the internet here on uh, Technology Matters, one of our Think Tech talks. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you, Mike. Aloha. Aloha.